Okay, I think we can start. Welcome, Yes, it's okay, March, Mark, Mark. Uh, 27th. Is it March 27th or 20th? What are we? March 27th, 2023. March 27th, yes. And yeah. uh, by the way, we, there was a nice ad for Tor in Motion, both the, the, the ethics conference, my summer trips, and uh, the classes in the Jewish link. If you get the Jewish link, I tell you something, I was in Florida. The same Jewish link we have here in New Jersey, we have in Florida. No, it, literally the same. It's not like they have Florida ads. It's the, the same sports scores from the local oh, so our ad made it to areas. Florida? I made it to Florida? Second? The ad we put in was in the Florida edition too? Yeah, well, it's not oh. the Florida. It's the same I... Jewish link. They okay. get it sent down there or something. Um, it's not like an edition. It's literally right. I, hear I hear Okay. Okay, let's get going, everyone. Uh, one thing I can't report is a, an article. I'm going to read it uh, hopefully in the next week. Of uh, 70 pages just came out from Aviad HaKohen. I don't know if he's ever spoken for Tar in Motion. Has he, Aviad HaKohen? He's no, uh, no, he has not. He's, he's a well-known figure in the religious Zionist world in Israel. His father, live and be well, uh, Menachem Akoli, Knesset member, right? He's Pinchas uh, Ali's nephew. So he's head of uh, one of the law schools, uh, a Gush graduate. He has a long article concerning, 70 pages here, concerning Rav Soloveitchik's uh, candidacy for the uh, rabbinate of Tel Aviv in 19... Uh, 35, the Chidat i Hagatol Eretz Yisrael, and the mystery of not him not coming to Israel. So a very, very long article that just came out. And uh, I see already uh, that one of the people he thanks is uh, uh, Rav Dr. Aharon Adler, who I believe is currently giving classes uh, right now. Oh, he also thanks me, I see. Okay. And from Moshe Lichtenstein. And, uh, oh, and so it's a very... Uh, it looks like a very complete article. Uh, I listened to the talk uh, last week, and I uh, I misspoke. If you listen to it, I, I'm talking about the um, uh, Rackman, Rabbi Rackman, and the candidacy for president. I said, and Professor Chaim Soloveitchik spoke against, it's reported he spoke against the Rav. I added a comment to the YouTube. I misspoke. Not that he spoke against the Rav that he spoke against while they were considering Rabbi Rackham's candidacy. I never asked him this. I don't feel comfortable. But the story is that he came in, uh, he spoke at the board meeting. He took out one man's Judaism and he read a few passages. So uh, he spoke against um, Rabbi Rackman, or at least that's the story. Now, that's, I think, maybe the origin for a something that's incorrect in Roshechter's book, which I'll read a few in a minute. I also have to thank David. David points out, Although in a number of places, this uh, this drusha of the Rav that we're going to continue in a few minutes, we're, we're in the middle, beginning of, um, before letter 18, where he uh, really blasts Rabbi Rackman's approach, uh, many places record this as an RCA convention. And David says he doesn't think so. He thinks it was a YU alumni. Um, and he provided the link for the, um, the uh, actual speech, which I could send anyone. And indeed, it was at a YU alumni uh, gathering. It was not at uh, an RCA convention. Some people I see get it right. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for that, David. Uh, let me tell you, uh, well, I don't have anything else to do. Uh, then let's get, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, so, but just a few more points about this uh, the, the talk of the Rav and the impact on it that it had, because I said that um, many people have reported that uh, this hurt his candidacy to be president of uh, YU. Now, remember, the Rav, uh, the Rav wasn't president and the Rav didn't make policy, but he obviously had a uh, had a big influence. But the board made the policy. Uh, yet uh, it is possible that it had a big impact. I'll give you some examples. And Moshe called my attention to this. When Rabbi Rackman passed away in tradition, uh, I think it's 2009, you have an article by uh, Norman Lamb. It has to on him. A very nice uh, article. And remember, they uh, they, they, they competed uh, for the presidency. And he says, this is on page 10, uh, he says as follows, that uh, first of all, he mentions that the Rav 
publicly berated Rabbi Rackman in 1975, and he also says the annual convention of the RCA. This is Rabbi Lamb saying, he, even he says it's an RCA convention, but I tell you it's not. It's a YU uh, alumni uh, gathering. So I, I wondered, I asked David, well, maybe um, maybe it's so at the RCA convention, they have a special section for YU alumni, but I don't think so. It's a YU alumni. Uh, and then he says, Lamb's article, he says that uh, this was, namely the Rov's public attack on Rabbi Rackman, was to an extent responsible for his failure to achieve any further promotion in communal office that might have been in store for him. He says that it was this powerful opposition to the Rov, combined with certain other considerations, that shattered Rackman's dream to succeed the late Dr. Belkin as the next president of Yeshiva University. And then he says this led to Rackman going to Israel as president and later chancellor of Bar-Ilan University. And, and Lamb says, these factors should not be overlooked in writing the history of those stormy days when the destiny of YU was being determined. And I pointed out that it's precisely those stormy days and this history that is left out of Jeffrey Gurak's book. And it's probably too late now. I mean, um, other than Maury Weiss, I don't, who I think was on the board then, I don't think any board members are still alive, but there, there's got to be minutes. And, uh, you know, it really, sh I would love to know behind the scenes, was this really the reason they didn't go with Rackman? Or, uh, like, you would think Rackman had long involvement with YU. He um, was uh, close to and had supporters among the wealthy uh, folk in uh, on the Upper West Side and elsewhere. Um, uh, although he was regarded as a bit radical. Remember, by going with Rabbi Lamb, that will take us into the era of centrism. Rackman was unquestionably modern orthodox, even on the liberal side of modern orthodoxy, even then. Lamb was, I mean, he had been editor of tradition. Um, he, he, he wasn't regarded as, uh, he wasn't going to ruffle anyone's feathers. So that could be uh, the reason, but that ties into the Rubs piece as well. Now, Lamb's article, I encourage everyone to read it because um, all, he basically charts the path of Rabbi Rackman and how towards the end of his life, and he attributes it to his great caring for uh, Jewish women, and but he really was led to at least what mainstream orthodoxy sees as uh, beyond uh, the fold in terms of uh, halachic uh, decision making, his based in, but uh, you need to, everyone needs to give Rabbi Rackman credit. He stood tall and proud in an era when modern orthodoxy was doomed to extinction, or so everyone thought. Orthodoxy, in fact, was doomed to extinction. The future was conservative Judaism. And uh, he, together with the Rav, uh, were really among the major interpreters of uh, what it means to be halakhically observant in modern times. And Rackman was a big popularizer of this. So he, it's true that at the end, he sort of moved out uh, still in orthodoxy, but very much on the, the left fringes. He was always liberal, but, uh, um, you know, he lived a very long life. So uh, you have to look at the first uh, seven decades of it as well. Incidentally, speaking of another figure who moved extremely to the left, uh, Rabbi Cardozo, I don't know if he's spoken at um, for Torah in Motion, but someone coming out of the regular yeshiva world uh, by now, he's on the way, way left, even maybe to the left of open orthodoxy. You can look online. He has the strongest defense, I think, of Rabbi Rackman that you'll find online. And it's a, uh, I mean, he writes about how uh, he's very disappointed. The Rav didn't have the courage of his convictions. He takes it as a given that Rabbi Rackman's correct. And uh, so if you want to see a strong defense of Rabbi Rackman against uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, you can look at um, Rabbi Cardozo. And if you want to see a halachic rejection of, uh, of Rabbi Bleich, again, halachic, without even getting into the Rav's point that we're going to get back right into, that this is this ontological, uh, this, you know, the, it's ontological that the women need to be, uh, they want to, you know, be with a man no matter uh, what a whole life he is. They prefer that. Uh, Irene emails me that uh, she doesn't understand this. Uh, she says, in her experience, men have it much more difficult to live by themselves than women. And she says, research backs that up as well. But I just will mention uh, Rabbi Blythe has a long article called Kiddushi Taut. I can't find it in his volumes of all writings, but it's in tradition, 99. So I don't know why it's not there. And also Rabbi Jachter. 
who spoke at Austin many times, I believe, for Torah in Motion, in Gray Matter, his volume and Hocha, volume one, they uh, both are very strongly critical of Rabbi Rachman and is based in simply on the idea that you can void marriages, leaving aside, they don't even have to get to the Rav's position. He mentions it, as I recall, uh, Rabbi Jachter, Blech, I don't know if he mentions it at all. And Rabbi Blech says that uh, he rejects the idea that what Rabbi Rachman said, that psychological abuse, adultery, sexual molestation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or even the withholding of a get may be viewed as indicating a sadistic nature. Remember, I told you that Rabbi Rachman explained to me that if a man withholds the get, it shows he's sadistic. And this was already uh, part of his uh, nature before they got married. I didn't know if that was ever published uh, in print. Uh, I mean, it was put in print, but it was. They, uh, the based in of, um, of Rabbi Rachman actually defended their approach and they wrote about it. And uh, Rabbi Blythe picks it up and he argues against this. He says that uh, people, he, he argues, first of all, from the notion of free will, that even if you say that someone uh, had this tendency, that's not a mekach talos, because, uh, you know, if it was a good marriage, that he would have lived uh, an entire life uh, without this coming out. People have free will. He, uh, he can, Rabbi Blythe compares it to blindness. He says, if someone, gets married to someone else and the other person is blind and they didn't know that, that's a mekartos. But if you marry someone and then 20 years later, the person develops blindness and the doctors tell you that the symptoms for this, that is what caused the blindness was already present uh, from birth, let's say, that's not a mekartos, Rabbi Blech said. That's, uh, that's something that develops in marriage. Not Just not everything that's there and latent is, uh, is a mekartos. Rabbi Black says character defects are viewed that we don't, we're not determinists. Uh, he says um, character is formed either by physiological predisposition or by antecedent events or a combination of the two. And so, and he goes on and says that although Judaism does not deny that character is molded by forces, it does insist that the will remains free. So, and the same basic argument is made by um, Rabbi Jachter as well. That, uh, I mean, he says the fact that a man has an abuser personality does not ensure he will abuse his wife. Basically, both of them say exactly what I said in my discussion with Rabbi Rachman. And that explains why it wasn't, uh, why it wasn't accepted. Okay, yeah. Oh, two, a couple more things. So I want to, so here I'm holding uh, Rabbi Rachman's One Man's Judaism, the second edition published in 2000, which, by the way, has a uh, review of my uh, biography, Rabbi Chayek of Weinberg. And he, on page 409, he defends himself. And he defends himself in the other article that he wrote in 1985 in Shema. I recorded that, he, that the Rav says to him, you look at halacha historically, I look at it meta-historically. Here he's a little stronger. He says, it's a pity that Rabbi Soloveitchik did not have the courage to help women more than he did. I think Rabbi Soloveitchik would be offended by this because it's not that, it's not that he didn't have the courage. It was, that, that's the language that like Cardozo, I think, uses. It, it's not that, no, actually, Cardozo says he wasn't able to take his uh, ideas to where they should have gone. It, it's not that Rabbi Soloveitchik didn't have the courage. It's not like uh, cases where you have post scheme who believe that the uh, of Weinberg was like this. They believe the halacha should be X. They think the sources all say this, but they don't have the courage. They say, who am I to be mater? Who am I to say this? That's Polsky Moron of the courage. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. Not something, you know, <laughs> you're supposed to be uh, what they call the you know, year hara, you know, uh, fear of, uh, not every post say can just be fearless. Or most of the team was fearless. But that's not the issue. The issue here, it's not that Rabbi Soloveitchik didn't have the courage. Uh, and he says that uh, when it came to uh, Jewish education, the Rav was a standard bearer. He also said he would never assign a uh, heteromay or bunny to allow a woman to marry. But he says the Rav did not have the courage. I don't know. I think he's... And then, and by the way, the very next page, page 410, listen to Rabbi Rackman. Blue Greenberg had written and said, where there is a rabbinic will, there is a rabbinic way. What David Eisen uh, uh, quoted, Rav Hussein is paraphrasing, 
Im tirtzu ein zo halacha. Let's play on uh, Herzl. If you wish it, it's not an agada. So, so he says, Bull Greenberg had written and said, where there is a rabbinic will, there, there is a rabbinic way. That is not heresy. It was the way of the oral law from the days of Moses. So Rabbi Rachman is agreeing 100% with Blue Greenberg. Now, I, there, there's an ex rabbinic expression that someone prophesied and didn't know what they prophesied. Because looking at it one way, Blue Greenberg is absolutely correct. But not the way she intended it. So she says, well, there's a rabbinic will, there's a halachic way. And uh, so what do I mean that uh, she's uh, correct in one way of looking at it? Because at the end, at the end of the day, he, he wrote where there's, he cited her where there's a rabbinic will, there's a rabbinic way. She said where there's a rabbinic will, there's a halachic way. Because at the end of the day, if the, take a figure, a great, great figure, like the Hassam Sofer. At the end of the day, if the Hassam Sofer becomes convinced that something is mutter, and he poskins this, that's then going to become the halacha. You can cite all the Gemaras in the world you want, but uh, at least for his followers and for many, it'll be enough. If, if Ravad Yosef would say something, uh, you can cite all the proofs or a most defined sin you want against them, but that's going to be uh, become, uh, you know, an acceptable position. So in factually, it is true. Where there's rabbinic will, it becomes halachic way. But that's not what Bugriberg means. She means that all you need is the post to say, I want it, and then to do it. And therefore, her implication is that post scheme, you should want there to be, let's say, no agunas. So therefore, just uh, make the decision, and it goes away. But that's post scheme don't operate that way. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, it's correct that if you have a great post who says something and feels a certain way, then that does become the halacha in, in almost all cases, even if uh, a lesser figure, they would throw him out of the base medrash for coming up with uh, what they think is really a far out argument. But that's not Apple Greenberg. She wants consciously to say simply because I want it, therefore go ahead and create the argument based on that. Uh, um, so I, I think it's much more complicated than how Boo Greenberg has it, although obviously the rabbi has to want it. If it's 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 no accident, I was reading something from Neria Gutel over Shabbos. He shows that in the debate over the census in Israel, all the religious Zionists post scheme rule that the census is permissible. All the uh, the Satmar type and the super Haredi they all rule it's usher. It's not an accident because if you think that if you value the state of Israel then that becomes one of your considerations in ruling Lakula. Um, now, before I go on, I just want to say two more things. We're going to come back to Rabbi Rachman in a minute, because um, um, I think this is important even before continuing with the Rav, because this is very relevant to what we did last class. Uh, remember, we the Rav spoke... It, just hold on to the end. Hold on to the at the end. We'll stop you. Yeah. If you recall, the Rav used the term Chachmei Masora, and he said that um, in order to, to, first of all, in order to decide how you you need to be part of the Chachmei Masora, and uh, I said that he's the first one to use it, uh, the, the expression. It, it's really not. I, I remember it after I was listening to it, Ramosha uses it. So the briskers are the first, first to use it. And in an article in Chakira, Moshe Fuss has an article about Ramosha Soloveitchik and he cites an example where Moshe Soloveitchik used this expression, Chachmei Masora, but for Moshe Soloveitchik, it only means the Tanaim and the Morai. That's who he's referring to. The Rav is referring to all Rishoni Machronim, one who's in the uh, the tradition of the Rabbanim. Now, the last thing I want to tell you before uh, moving on, and and, oh, sorry, and I, I, if you go on Otsar Chachma, you plug in Chachmei Hamasora. The Rav, he, he loves this expression. He says, he, he talks about in one of his famous essays, in Misham, he speaks about how he grew up in the, together with Chachmei Amasora. He says the, the Achas, our connection, was a, a personal one. The Ramba Mimini, Rabbeinu Tamismoli, Rashi was sitting in front. If you recall that story of the Rav, you know, where he tells where you know all these gedolim are sitting on the side of me and we're arguing and they're still alive. Those are the Chachmei Masora. The last thing I want to share with you before I uh, return with the Rav's letter, 
with the Rav's attack on Rabbi Rachman, is something Rav Shachter said that uh, Rav Shachter, uh, where is it here? Um, he, he talks about this letter. He talks about the Rav's uh, attack on Rabbi Rachman. And this answers the question we had last class. This is in Mipnine Harav, page 341 in the new edition. He says that um, there is a rabbi. He doesn't mention his name. Uh, he says, Rav Orthodoxy Echad Yadua, a well-known Orthodox rabbi, at a gathering of rabbis, said, in his opinion, the, psycho the psychological assumptions of today that, that, uh, that are not that um, a woman would marry basically anyone. Uh, he says, and then so, uh, and he says, therefore, perhaps, Rav Rachman said, we can change certain halachot are based on this. And then Rav, Rav Shachter says, Rabbein, Rav Soloveitchik, was uh, very strongly against this. And he um, responded publicly. He, he, he doesn't say the R.S.A. convention. He says, at Yeshiva University, in a shir before the Musmachi. So that's the, Ars, the rabbinic alumni. And he says that the Rav explained, um, uh, although this is not found in the, uh, what the, what Rav Shechter says is not found in the talk at all. But he says that the Rav explained that even though we have chazakas that change. So, for example, um, there's a chazaka David asked last class, Ain isha me'iza paneh b'fnei bala, that the woman's not going to, you know, publicly uh, lie. Uh, she's having a machokas. Uh, she's having... Um, you know, there's a dinner dvari between her and her husband, and she's going to say in front of him something that uh, she's not going to lie publicly. And he's not going to lie right in front of him. The Rav could say, Rav, he quotes the Rav as saying, now, the Rav didn't say that at this talk. It's not in the transcript. It's not in the tape. But he could have said it another time. Uh, the Rav said that could change. And uh, and he says that uh, the halachas, therefore, would change. Um, he says, the Rav said, there's another halacha in your idea. Uh, you have a chazaka, that Nusa David Agui, something which uh, you're not going to say something false, which then could come out later that everyone sees it's false. You're going to lie when you think you can get away with it. You're not going to lie if there's a chance that it could become um, known. And he says that the Rav said that uh, today uh, people are not embarrassed to lie. And the Rav, Rav Shachter quotes the Rav as saying something which has, which is definitely wasn't said, said at this time. And I, I don't know if uh, he's misremembering or whatever, because he says, or the Rav misremembered, that the Rav said that at the UN, Kennedy turned to Khrushchev at the UN during the Cuban Missile Crisis and said to him, do you have missiles in Cuba? And Khrushchev said in front of everyone, and he said that this was on the, the news, the television, that uh, no. And then Kennedy showed the entire world uh, pictures of the um, the uh, the missiles. Well, and, uh, and and it didn't bother Khrushchev. Well, I mean, there's an element of truth here. There was an American ambassador at the UN, and there was the discussion, but Kennedy wasn't at the UN with Khrushchev. There never was this confrontation together with them when he pointed to him and they asked him this, and Khrushchev said no. It never happened. Uh, Khrushchev didn't come to the UN to argue this, and Kennedy wasn't there with him. So you have the... Um, this is an issue with Rav Shechter's books, that uh, often you have things that aren't necessarily correct. And I'll give you an example, but uh, they're basically, they're, the idea is correct here. And so then, so then Rav Shechter says, so then why is this any different? Why did the Rav think this is different, the case of Tavol Meitav Tandu, that we assume that the woman uh, would rather be married? We don't, if the other Chazakos change, why, don't, why doesn't this one change? And Rav Shechter said the Rav felt this way because it's written in a pasuk that uh, something um, it's 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 the he says in this case Chazal were not just deriving this from their view of uh, the, the situation they lived in women's psychology he says Lamdu they they learn this me'apsukim and we saw that the Rav quoted the psukim so um, okay so uh, we'll leave that at there now. Um, in Mipnini um, Harav, 
also this book on page uh, 217, Rav Schechter says something which it's just not true. Uh, I hate to say it, but it's not true. He says that after Rabbi Belkin died and they had to choose a new president for Shiva University, Rabbi Soloveitchik decided that one of the candidates, namely Rabbi Rachman, is not worthy of being president because of his untraditional views. Now, it could be the Rav thought that. Rachman denied it. Uh, could be the Rav thought it. If the story with Professor Chaim, Chaim's okay is true, maybe, maybe that's the case. What's not true, though, is what he says next. He says that Rav Soloveitch had gathered all the Rosh Yeshiva together, and they put together a, a, a letter to the board of Yeshiva University that uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik formulated a letter to the board of Yeshiva University that he opposes Rabbi Rachman being appointed, and he signed his name at the bottom, and he gave this to all the other Ramim at YU and uh, to sign. Now, that never happened. The Rav never wrote such a or wrote never got wrote such a letter. Never got all their other Rosh Yeshiva to sign such a letter. How do I know that? Because someone from the board of YU, I spoke to someone from the board of YU. Well, first of all, it doesn't appear anywhere else. And Rabbi Rachman wouldn't have said that the Rav supported if that was the case. And I've spoken to a lot of people. I even spoke to someone who was on the board of YU. So this is. Uh, as far as I know, this is nothing, 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 such a thing never happened. I never heard of it. No one I spoke to who was involved ever heard it. Um, actually, no two people who were at the uh, at the discussions. Uh, they never heard it. So uh, how could it be true? Uh, but then an interesting point is he says that one of the um, the Ramim, the Rosh Yeshiva, asked Rabbi Soloveitchik, why are you so upset with Rabbi Rachman? Um, and Rabbi, and Rabbi Soloveitchik is reported to have said that uh, Rabbi Rachman accepts the second Isaiah. That is, there are two Isaiahs, uh, not just one. And therefore, uh, anyone who uh, who says that it was written by two separate people, Api Korasu, is a heretic. And he can't be appointed president of Yeshiva University. Uh, and... Um, so then, this, so, so there. He, according to this, you have him calling Rabbi Rachman uh, Picarus because he accepts Second Isaiah. And um, Rav Shechter continues that in Abar Benel, he also sometimes says uh, strange things against the tradition. And uh, Rav Shechter records him as saying, Rav Shechter's not there. These are sometimes Rav Shechter's there. He records it. Other times, it's what he's told. It's and even he says sometimes Shamati. That's when you need to. Uh, you know, be very careful, because when he's just reporting what he's heard, and this is something he wasn't there, he's reporting what he heard. Uh, so then uh, what did the Rav reply? I also wouldn't want a Barbanel to be president of Yeshiva University. And with that, the dispute ended, and all the Rashi Yeshiva signed this letter, and it was given to uh, the board, and um, his candidacy was finished because of that. So, uh uh, okay, I don't. It, it's a bubble mice. Uh, unless come, someone can come up with uh, a proof that it's not. Uh, never heard this. Never recorded anywhere. The people, men on the board I spoke to, two, and one of the people who was involved in the discussions over the president. No one's uh, heard of such a thing. Uh, and the fact is that Rackman never says that about the second Isaiah. What he said in his article and what's in uh, one man's Judaism. He doesn't say that he accepts second Isaiah. What he says is as follows on page 248 and 249. He says that um, I'll read you the exact uh, words. Um, he says the a volume recently published makes an excellent argument for the position that there was but one Isaiah. But must one be shocked when it is opined that there may have been two or three prophets bearing the same name? No sage of the past ever included in the Articles of Faith a dogma about the authorship of the books of the Bible other than the Pentateuch. That sounds very much like a Barbanel. But uh, so it's not like Rachman, um, as uh, Rav Schechter says, it's not like Rabbi Rachman uh, wrote an article Shalafi dato, Shnechal Kesefi Shah Nichtavu Al Yadesh Nebene Adam. 
He never wrote that. What is he said is he doesn't think it's heresy. Now, what is the article, the, the book? We've mentioned this already. The book he refers to as having been written, written arguing that there's one Isaiah, that, uh, that book was written by this woman, a woman who uh, is not really known. She should be. Everyone knows Nechama Libowitz. How come people don't know Rachel Margoliot? Rachel Margoliot, a great biblical scholar from an important family, as we'll see, she wrote the book, Echad Haya Yishayahu. She also wrote Eov, Kamoshahu, and another book about uh, Harsinai, uh, as it's understood by the Rishonim and Achronim. She lived a very long life, died in 2009. Why is Rachel Margolio not known? Uh, uh, I mean, traditional Torah learning, as well as a son of a, a daughter of a rabbi, as well as an academic uh, scholar. So why she's not known, I don't know. Her husband was this individual, Mordechai Margoliot, or Margolis, taught at the seminary for many years. He's a, um, he edited uh, Encyclopedia of the Sages of the Talmud, Nagoni. Most important, his edition of the Midrash uh, Vayikra Rabbah, as well as other works. Uh, great, great scholar. Her brother, she had two brothers, three brothers. One brother is Rav Yisak Kulitz. Chief Rabbi of Jerusalem. The other brother is Chaim Kuwitz. Chaim Kuwitz, who wrote the uh, the biography of the Chazonish. If you many things he wrote, but it's Chose Milita. If you can get the book, it's worth uh, getting it because uh, um, the reason it's worth getting it is because uh, that's where he describes the Chazonish's wife and the difficult relationship, which everyone knew, but he actually wrote about. Uh, it's interesting. And a third brother is Svi Kolitz, who I think one of you, because uh, we mentioned him in the previous class, knew him. Um, he's famous because he's the one who wrote, uh, you see it on um, Wikipedia, Yossel Rockover Talks to God. This was a, a fictional story that uh, he wrote, the Holocaust uh, story. Uh, and uh, yet um, people thought it, it was published in a newspaper in Buenos Aires and then it was republished. And people thought it was an authentic and it was translated to English and Hebrew and appeared in, as it says here, in Holocaust anthologies. They thought it was a real testimony from the Warsaw Ghetto. But uh, only later in his life, as it says, was he able to reclaim, capture his story and uh, claim it as his own. So that's um, the Kulitz family. Okay, let's return to our story now. Uh, I want to pick up with the Rav's letter, with the Rav's drosha. If you recall, last class, uh, we did about half of it. And one of the things I mentioned was the Rav identifies as a, first he says it's close to heresy, and then he refers to it as heresy. That is, machish magideha. If you deny the um, the authority of those trans transmitters of the Masora. It seems to be a contradiction. I, the, I suggested that perhaps he's refer and, and I'm gonna this what I'm gonna say now is uh I think can um, support this that if you say this about the sages of the Talmud, then it's a heresy. If you say it about later authorities, it, it verges on heresy because I should have stressed one more point. After mentioning Machish Magideha. He says as follows, uh, even if you admit, those who admit the truthfulness of Torah Shabbat Peh, but are critical of Chachmei Chazal as personalities, who find fault with Chachmei Chazal, fault in their characters, who say that Chachmei Chazal were prejudiced, which had an impact on the, and this prejudice had an impact uh, on the halacha. In the, in, the, in the text here, as it's transcribed, it says, if you say that Chachmei Chazal were prejudiced, which actually has no impact upon the halacha, this is a mistake. It should be which had an impact on the halacha. Such a person is considered a kofer. So that's what Rav Soloveitchik says. If you say that the reason the rabbis have certain halachot, which maybe um, women come out, you think, uh, on the short side, is because the rabbis were reflecting prejudices of their time, that sort of thing. That, Rav Soloveitchik says, is, machi, is uh, machi, you're, de you're basically denying the authority you're casting aspersions on the transmitters uh, of the Torah. And uh, that's what he means. It says, if you were kofer, 
in the not just of the perushim of the Torah Shavuot Peh, but also Hamachish Magideha, the truthfulness of Chachmei Gazal, not of the Torah, but of Chachmei Gazal's personalities, of their philosophy. So that's that's an important point. But again, Rachman wasn't saying that. He, he all he was saying was that they were reflecting an era, the women in their era. Now the Rav picks up. Let's continue with the Rav. Uh, before we get to, uh, and again, this is all, <laughs> we might not even get to the letter today, but this is all a preface for the Rav's letter, the short letter, which uh, he explains why and the difficulty it was for him to publicly come out against uh, uh, Rabbi Rackman. So he continues in, in this uh, drasha. As as I mentioned last week, this was this was before. This was, uh, he was supposed to have a uh, drasha on Hilchos Geras. And he decided that before that, he needs to uh, speak about this matter. So before he gets to Hilchus Geiros, he talks about this. And he says that I was also told that it was recommended that the method of Afkinu Rabbanon Kiddushin be reintroduced. The idea that the sages are able to um, void conversions, void uh, marriages. And um, I mean, this goes together with the idea that uh, if the woman married and you say, well, had she known about these things in her husband, she wouldn't have married him. Okay, the rabbis can void the marriage. And uh, and that's really what the problem he saw with Rabbi Rachman's proposal. And the Ruff says, if we start voiding marriages, then uh, there will be no need for a get, he says. There will be no need. He says, we will be able to cross out the mission, this Mishnah, this halacha. Every rabbi will spend the Kedushim. Um and why he says, why are you going to say, well, that the chief rabbin of Israel, they're going to be the ones who have the authority to do this. The Rav says it's not going to work. Why should uh, this privilege be monopolized by the chief rabbinate? Why couldn't the RCA do it? Why couldn't any rabbi do it? So he says that this idea of which, um, you know, once you start speaking about uh, that uh, every marriage, you know, who says the woman will want to be married? That's going to lead directly into a, a, you know, abolishing marriages, and then uh, we don't have halacha anymore. He says. Now my point is, though, you could have said that without, like Rabbi Bleich in his argument, you could completely reject the Rackman approach as it later comes to fruition, the Rackman based in, without ever bringing in the idea that the chazaka remains the same. You don't even have to go there at all. Uh, and uh, you can still find fault with uh, the idea that just because a man doesn't give a get, that means that he has uh, a psychological problem, so it's mekach tos. In other words, you don't need to make the rub, but the Rav made that argument. And then listen to this language. I want to be frank and open. Do you expect to survive as Orthodox rabbis? He's speaking to the, RC, the rabbinical alumni. Do you expect to carry on the Mesorah under such circumstances? I hope that those who are present will join me in simply objecting to such symposia and to such discussion and debate at the rabbinical convention. And then the Rav says, when I was told about this, that there are rabbis, because Rabbi Rachman was talking about uh, Afkinu, that the rabbis they, therefore can be um, uproot marriages. He says, when I was told about this, I thought, is it possible? He says, I can't imagine that at the Republican or Democratic National Convention, they would introduce a symposium on communism and democracy. And then later, he go, he returns to it, but he only mentions Republicans. He says that, um, uh, for instance, at the National Convention of the Republican Party, would anyone dare to speak about this sort of thing? It's uh, speaking about changing the halachos of Chazal is as least as nonsensical as discussions about communism at the Republican National Convention. It's discussing self-destruction, a method of self-destruction and suicide. So this is as strong as you can get. And, uh, I mean, and but I love how the Rav brings in communism and the Republican, and not just the Republican. He throws in the Democrats also, because in those days, in the 70s, uh, look, uh, McGovern lost, and you still had a Scoop Jackson wing of the Democratic Party, John F. Kennedy Democrats. Today, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's plenty of Democrats today who'd be happy to talk communism if they call it socialism, whatever. But uh, and, I mean, no other Russia yeshiva, I think, would use that language. But it just shows you, uh, this is the Vietnam era as well, how foreign this is and what a destruction of Torah Judaism this is. That even to question the... Um, the chazakas of Chazal, not just the halacha, not just to say we're going to do afkinu, we're going to give the rabbis the authority to avoid marriages. 
But even to question the Chazaka, the Rav sees as uh, very, very dangerous. He says that, uh, I know all the problems we're facing. I'm mindful of the challenges. But if you think that the solution lies in the reformist philosophy, he's calling Rabbi Rackman's approach a reformist philosophy, um, you are sadly mistaken. Then he says, it's self-evident many problems are unsolvable. You can't help it. For instance, the problem of Mzeirim and Eretz Yisrael. So this is a theme that the Rav would expand elsewhere as well. The idea of surrender. He even uses this language later, just a few sentences later. He says, this is Taurus Moshe. This is surrender. This is Kabbalah Sol Machu We surrender. The Rav uh, develops the idea, which he'll say at other times as well, that at times you need to just say, we surrender. We surrender to the yoke of the commandments. We don't have solutions to everything. And that's what it means to be a mommy, to be a believer. Just like we surrender in theological matters, we don't understand that, so too at times in halachic matters we surrender. He gives a, he tells a whole story here about uh, this couple, this non-Jewish girl becomes religious, becomes Jewish, she converts from Rochester, for, for real. You know, she was convinced of the truth of Judaism, not for marriage. And then she meets a boy and uh, who had no knowledge of Judaism. And she was Makari of him. She made him, uh, she brought Torah to him. And they got engaged and they're in love and all that. And then they go to the cemetery. He wanted to find out about his family because he doesn't know anything. And they see this strange symbol with the hands and they investigate and uh, shows he's from a family of Kohanim. His, uh, he's a Kohen because it would have been the paternal side. So they wanted to know, what could they do? They came to the, came to the question, came to the Rav. This is a, what a tragedy. She, uh, she converts. He becomes religious. They want to marry. And the Rav says, um, um, you know, what can you do? Quote, what can you do? This is the halacha. The Kohen is us or to the Yaris. We surrender to the will of the Almighty. Now, the... There are post game, at least Ramosha. He probably would have been Mako in this case, or at least we have times so some of his students were Mako because of uh, the idea that uh, this is a non religious family. And it's reported that Ramosha was very Mako in this, uh, Rabbi Tendler or others, because the assumption is that if it's a non religious family, we don't trust the Yichos. The fact that it's on the cemetery. It doesn't matter if it's a non, I don't know, I don't know how far Ramosha took this. I know for a fact of two cases, for a fact. I know this, and I know one of the cases personally, where, based on Rav Moshe, and uh, two of them was from someone uh, from Rav Moshe's family, the um, the uh, the Cohen status was avoided because of the uh, it was not a religious family, and uh, if you don't have a continuous yichus of Masora. The fact that someone says they're a Kohen, uh, they haven't been religious in uh, 50, 100 years as family, uh, how do we rely on them? I think other post scheme do not accept us. I think everyone generally assumes that if you're at the cemetery and you see the um, the grave. Now, in the cases I'm talking about, well, I don't know, I guess it wouldn't matter, the grave, because if, if someone thinks he's a Kohen and he's not religious and he dies, they'll put it on his grave too. But I think most of the post scheme assume that that's considered a good simon, and that even if someone's not religious, we can rely on the fact that he says he's a Kohen. In fact, in one of the cases I know, um, the person always was assumed to be a Kohen, only when now, when to get married, now we not a Kohen. So uh, um, it, it's a tough thing. It's a tricky thing, because I know of a case, one of the cases I know of, where the other siblings are still Kohenim. Um, so uh, so how do you have it where one is not a Kohen and he get married, but the others are uh, still Kohenim? I, I don't know. But that was, I don't know, again, I don't know all the details of Ramosha, but at least the Hector supposedly goes back to Ramosha. And I know for a fact, this is, I know two cases personally, and I know of other cases, but the Rav says no. As far as the Rav was concerned, having the, um, the, the, the Kohen sign was enough. And what does the Rav say? We surrender. There are things we don't, uh, we can't change, and that's uh, part of Torah. He goes on to say, halacha, don't say that halacha is not sensitive to problems. On the contrary, he says halacha is very sensitive, but the halacha has its own orbit, and we can't always get the answer we want to halacha. The Rav says, there's sadness in my heart. I share in the suffering of the poor woman. 
who was instrumental in bringing him back to the fold. And then she had to lose him. But uh, you can't always uh, get, you know, this isn't conservative Judaism. Uh, the conservative halakhic theory, these hard cases, you fall back on conscience. At the end of the day, for the conservative uh, rabbis, they'll try to show that he's not a Kohen. But if he is a Kohen, they'll say, well, they've gotten rid of that. They'll say, uh, you know, it violates our conscience or something. But obviously, our Salvechik uh, couldn't say that. The only way you can allow this marriage is if you can find a halachic argument. And the Rav says no. And this idea of surrender. And uh, then he goes on in the last paragraph. He talks about um, the Rambam. He says that anyone who speaks of halacha as a fossil, it's ridiculous. Now, I, I, I don't think Rabbi Rachman ever spoke about halacha as a fossil, or e even uh, Rabbi Berkovitz. I, but there were people in the non-Orthodox who spoke, uh, and Rabbi Rachman and Rabbi Berkovitz did speak about how halacha should be moving more. It should be more creative. I don't know if they, I don't think they ever used the word fossil. Fossil was the term used by Toynbee about Judaism, that it's a, it's a fossil religion. But uh, so the, then the Rav says, this is very important. He says, we are opposed to shinoyim, changes in halacha. But idush is the essence of halacha. There are no shinoyim in halacha. There are no changes in halacha, but there are great chidushim. It's tricky to know what's a chidush and what's a shinoi. Because one person's shinoi would be another person's chidush. Uh, it would be very hard to know what's, uh, because the Rav is attacking something here as a, as a change, where others might say it's not a change, it's a chidush. Uh, he says, but the Rav gives an explanation, at least in his, how he sees it. He says, um, chidushim are within the system, not from the outside. So a chidush that comes up with a new way of understanding the halacha that is developed out of the halacha. So you can come up with a completely new halacha, a completely new understanding. Until now, you were doing X, and now you come up with it, and you say, no, this is not the way you do halacha. We have to do halacha this way. So the outsider would say, that's a change. It used to be this, and now it's that. And the Rav says, that's not a change. That's a chidush, because it, it came for internally how you interpret the halacha. And what does he mean by an out uh, shinoi? He, he tells us. He says you can't psychologize halacha. You can't historicize halacha. You can't rationalize halacha because this is something foreign, extraneous. He says, can you psychologize mathematics? Uh, you can't give psychological reasons. He says why Euclid said two parallels cannot cross. Um, it, it, it all Mathematics has to be understood internally. And he says the same thing about halacha. The great irony here is that his own son, Professor Chaim Soloveitchik, is one of the leading scholars in, in, in historicizing halacha. Now, granted, he doesn't historicize, he doesn't do chazal. He's not looking at chazal and explaining the rabbis of the Talmud, but he is doing it with Rishoni. I'm not sure if the Rav would be so much opposed to Rishoni. He's really speaking here about the, the sages of the Talmud. Uh, I mean, he does include the Rishonim as part of Chachmi Masorah, and he might see it inappropriate. But remember, that's not when he spoke about heresy. He specifically was referring to the sages of the um, of the Talmud. So that's the difference for the Rav. What's the difference between a Shinoi and a Chidush? A Chidush develops internally. So you can come up with a completely new way of understanding the Halacha, and Reb Chaim did this on occasion. So it's understood completely different than what we did until now, but that's okay, because that's a Chidush. A shinoi, a change, is like a reform. Why do reformers change halacha? Because of outside pressures, because of outside ideas that cause them to reevaluate. So if you're going to change the position of women because of uh, modern psychology or because uh, you say historically they're in a different circumstance or any halacha, that's reform Judaism. If you come up with a new way of understanding the halacha, it could be lakula, it could be lachumra. The Rav had great chumras as well, but it could be lakula. So, for instance, um, uh, we're coming up to Cholamoid. If you say that uh, you, based out of the sources, you explain that the, if you look at the re the justifications, the reasons given why you don't do laundry on Cholamoid, why you don't shave on Cholamoid, and you look and you explain 
based on those reasons, and then you look at the Messias and say that uh, the, it doesn't apply anymore today, that's internal to the system. And that would, uh, you could say, it's not a reform. It's simply applying the uh, the original understanding of the halakha. And so it's a new circumstance. And so now you can shave. That, that would be a chidush. But if you'd say something like, well, uh, today, you know, it's considered, uh, I don't know, uh, uncouth not to shave or the rabbis uh, were influenced by this when they said that or whatever, whatever. that would be a reform so are you going to buy it everyone i think some people won't buy it but i, I think it has an internal consistency the, the, the problem is whether you accept the rub's idea that everything is internal to the halakha he's denying this outside influence on it but once you accept that position of his I think it's clear the difference, although for the outsider, you might say this looks like a reform, but it's clear it's not a reform because um, it's developed internally by using the system to come up with something. That's very different than uh, being influenced by all these other uh, forces. And then he, he concludes, instead of complaining about the inflexibility of halacha, let us explore its endless spaces and enjoy Talmud Torah and find in Talmud Torah a redemptive, cathartic, and inspiring reality. That's all I wanted to say. Now let us get to the shear. So this whole piece, uh, which I don't know if they were, people remember the shear on Gerus, but everyone remembers this. It's, uh, it's one of the classic statements of the Rav, sort of, I, I think it was ad-libbed, as far as I know. I don't think he had this written out. Uh, and it's become really a classic statement of the Rav on Halakha, on uh, you know, how we're supposed to relate to it with all the questions. Uh, does the Rav really mean that this, this Chazaka is absolute? I think so. I think he means it. And uh, I don't know if it's only because of the Pasuk or um, I'm not sure. Though. It, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's questionable uh, how to understand this uh, because it does seem to violate what we see with our eyes. Uh, okay. So that's the uh, the Rav's strong attack, very important in the history of uh, American Orthodoxy, post 20th century. It really set uh, its, here you have the Rav, uh, you know, really slapping down uh, a leading um, modern Orthodox rabbi. And um, Rabbi Lamb says that this uh, was one of the reasons why we didn't get the presidency. Um, by the way, Jeffrey Wolf, or by Jeffrey Wolf, he also has a piece on the, the Rav's understanding of Masora. And um, he, first of all, he quotes, uh, this is in note um, six. He says that, like we heard from David Eisen, that uh, Rav Lichtenstein has been quoted by close disciples as registering serious question as to whether this Chazaka is impervious to change, as the Rav asserted. So, um, I mean, the Rav, his language, he says it's it's Fira to say that this could change. But here it's been reported there, I've looked and how that. Now, I don't understand because um, uh, Jeffrey Wolf says Rav Schechter also noted difficulties in the Rav's interpretation of the presumption. And he says that Rav Schechter also registered a question as to whether it's impervious to change. And what he cites is what I read you. And as I, the way I read it, it's uh, he, the Rav Schechter is not. Um, registering serious question of the Rav, all he's doing is pointing out, you have these other Chazakas, these other Chazakas do change, what's the difference? And any he cites the Rav as explaining the difference. In fact, um, it wasn't just that, he cited the Rav as, uh, he says the Rav himself explained the difference. But uh, he does cite um, Rav Lachnesim. Now, on the previous page in this article, which you can get on his um, academia site, on note five, he says as follows. Let me just read it to you. And I wish I could ask the Rav this question. My student, Dr. Eliza Bazak, examined the use made of this presumption, namely Tavo Metotandu, by halakhic authorities over the course of half a millennium. She discovered, ironically, that prior to the post-war period, Post scheme overwhelmingly discussed this chazaka in two ways. One, in order to show that it did not apply, or two, to invoke it for the benefit of the woman. 
So he, I haven't seen, uh, he cites her master's dissertation here, uh, Hashimush, you know, using the Chazak of Tav Ametav in uh, halachic discussions. I, I like to see the sources she cites, I, I, because I said that Ramosha, I don't see how you can read Ramosha as accepting this, but uh, so is is is, is, is the Rav Adas Yachid on this? Is the Rav a minority approach on this? Um, that would be quite ironic if he was, and maybe would support the argument that the Rav was arguing uh, polemically here. But it would also be ironic, because I can't tell you how many people in discussing the episode cite the Rav's position and his criticism of Rachman as an ik, the 14th Ikaramuna. That what the Rav says about this Chazaka is, uh, is absolute, and if you deny it, you're, doing, you're saying Kefiro, like uh, Rabbi Rachman, if it's the case that uh, we have a whole list of uh, other poskim who say differently, then um, you can hold by the Rav's position, but to use it to uh, attack other people and, 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 and cast them as reformers and uh, as heretics, because they're saying that the, uh, the Chazaka might change, people on the right wing of modern orthodoxy pull this out all the time and say... Uh, as the Rav said, that uh, to disagree with this is heresy because you're questioning the Chazaka. As we saw, the, it's reported that Rav Lechtenstein himself uh, uh, didn't uh, find this convincing. So I just find that uh, of note. Um, let me, uh, even though it's 927, let me just, I, I figure we spoke so long, let's at least do the letter because it's a quick letter. Uh, letter 18. Um, I can't even remember who gave me the letter. And it doesn't have the name of the recipient, uh, so I don't know who it is. It's handwritten by the Rav. Uh, do I have it here? Uh, oh, no, I don't have it here. But it's, it's a handwritten letter from the Rav. And it's addressed to uh, someone who calls him Rav Agon Ish Ashkolot, but I don't know who that is. And he simply says as follows. First of all, he said, he must, something was attributed to the Rav, so he says, I, I never said that. But I don't know what that's referring to. But then he says... Two years ago, this letter, the Rav is writing this uh, in 1978. Remember, he attacks the Rav. He attacks in uh, 1975, 76, 75, uh, Rabbi Rachman. Um, he says that uh, articles appeared. He's referring to Rabbi Rachman's article in the Jewish Examiner. It actually, the title of the newspaper wasn't the Jewish Examiner. I looked it up. It was called the Jewish Week and the American Examiner. And later it becomes the Jewish Week. Rabbi Rachman would have a column in that there for years. I'm sure many people listening to us now can remember Rabbi Rachman's uh, weekly column that over the years became more and more uh, on the left. Uh, Rabbi Lamb speaks about this in his eulogy. And the Rav says as follows, these articles are from our friend. He calls them Yedidin. It's a few years after his great attack on Rabbi Rachman. He says, I'll give you um, the, the date is, yes, 1975. So this is um, Tammuz of 78, um, he says, well, he says at the um, rabbinic RCA convention, he said similar things to what he published in the newspaper. In other words, Rabbi Rachman spoke about this at the RCA convention, the idea that the he was the president of the RCA, not at that time, but at other times. He was a big macher, a leading figure in the RCA, uh, one of the originators, founder on the board of tradition, uh, um, so he said that Rabbi Rachman spoke about this at the RCA. He says, when I was heard about this later, namely not the articles, he's meaning that Rabbi Rachman publicly at the RCA convention set forth his idea that Tavamet of Tandu should um, no longer be applicable today. He said, I protested against the articles and the speech. The Rav says, he says Ma'od twice. He says, this was exceedingly difficult for me to do. Because this individual, Rabbi Rachman, is one of my faithful friends for many years. As I told you, they, in the 1950s, Rabbi Rachman coordinated with Rabbi Soloveitchik the whole, his articles on how to defend the halachic system in the modern times, and uh, they were very close for decades. There were, he wasn't a Talmud, he was so, already from Ramosha Soloveitchik, but very, very close to the Rav. And the, the Rav says, nevertheless, despite the, um, the, the, the Tsar, 
the, the, the pain that my protest caused me, he says, I couldn't remain silent. He says, I protested in the presence, more than a hundred people were there. And um, so I think this letter is of interest because you see, unlike many of the followers of the Rolf on the right wing, who as soon as this came out against Rabbi Rachman, then all of a sudden they begin referring to Rabbi Rachman as a kofair and out of the fold and citing the Rav. Here, and, uh, here you see the Rav doesn't have that response at all. You see the Rav is conflicted. And the Rav is saying, I did what I thought I had to do, but it was very painful for me because he's a good friend of mine. But I thought I had to do it. You know, this is Torah and I have to do it. Many of the students of the Rav, they didn't feel tsar. This, they felt like happiness that now they can bless uh, Rabbi Rachman on the authority of uh, the Rav. And um, they felt uh, hana, uh, the, the way to like read him out of the fold. And the Rav doesn't feel this way. The Rav feels great pain. This is three years later. And you see the Rav still feels it. He says, uh, so we see that this was not an easy thing for the Rav to do. This wasn't something that he relished doing. And uh, there's something that caused him a great deal of pain. But uh, he felt he had to do it, just like it caused him a great deal of pain to tell the girl from Rochester she couldn't marry the guy. So I, that's, so I think it's important to show that, yes, the Rav did what he did. He felt he had to. He was honest. But uh, his reaction is very different than uh, many others who uh, took it. They wouldn't say that uh, I'm attacking Rabbi Rachman and it causes me great sar. No, like I said, they got great hana because they could show finally they could uh, throw him out. So uh, uh, important, important letter, I think, even though it's a very short letter. And uh, we just, we have three more letters. So uh, next week, uh, or yeah, well, maybe we'll get to Mechitza. Notice we're getting all the big issues, except for girls studying Talmud, which we'll do, uh, we'll do a few classes on the health God book and we'll get to that. But, um, you know, there's a scholar in Israel who wrote a piece on Eliezer Berkowitz. And in the piece, he, he said, like, remember I told you the rabbi at Rav Aaron Solveitchik's house, he didn't know this dispute, and I couldn't understand it, but I looked it up. Uh, I looked at the show website, you know, he's not a YU graduate. Uh, I, I, he's not a YU Muslim. He went to YU, you knew this. So a guy in Israel, he actually thinks that uh, the Rav's attack is against Eliezer Berkowitz. And he writes, you know, <laughs> Eliezer Berkowitz. Uh, and I wrote to him and I said, no, no, it's Rachman. And, um, and maybe he's thinking, you sure? This and how do you know? He doesn't mention Rabbi Rachman by name. It's like only someone living in Israel who doesn't know anything about American Orthodoxy. I mean, it's just in, like this was like the talk of the town. This is like the whole, this was a major event. So, uh, but, uh, you know, years later, someone could look at it and say, well, who was he attacking? Well, Berkowitz published an article, a book, a uh, book. A few years before that, Tanayu uh, Nasun Baget, and this person in the article speaks about, you know, the Rav attacking, you know, conditional marriages. It's not true. The Rav says nothing about conditional marriages. It has nothing to do with conditional marriage. That's a different issue, a different controversy. Can you have, uh, that's, that's Rabbi Berkowitz's proposal. The Rav doesn't mention that at all. The Rav is simply speaking about uh, the Chazaka and Tavamet of Tandu and being uh, Mafkiya Kedushin. But because uh, the person in Israel didn't know that this was Rachman's position, he just assumed, uh, and he asked literally anyone who went to YU from like uh, any musmach of YU from uh, the 40s into the 80s or the 90s, I think literally anyone would have told them it's not Berkowitz. But okay. Uh, David says, where was Professor Cohen's article published? It just came out. Dov Schwartz, Sabari Lan, edits this volume. They have like nine, nine volume is now called Sionut and uh, that's where it appeared, and uh, I have a PDF I could send it to anyone, uh, or maybe I should ask permission, I can't say what I, I was given it. Um, now, this these letters, which we're discussing right now, originally I thought of publishing them in uh, the Dove Schwartz's volume, the uh, Studies in Religious Zionism that comes out every few years, but then I thought, you know, at the end of the day, this is more of an academic publication. And if I want the Oilam to see it, Chakira is a better place. And um, and I, 
to Aviada Cohen, really, he should have published this article in Chakira, although he would have got maybe more readers. Um, uh, Nissen says, was the father of Menachem, the MK from Avoda? Yes, he was in the Labor Party. Um, he was, uh, for years, he was, um, let's see how old he is. Uh, there were three brothers. Um, he was born in 1932. Yes, let me pull up a screen here so you can see it. Uh, um, and in the article, he uh, has discussions with... Um, uh, discussions his father had with um, the Rav. Now, so there was also uh, Shmuel Avidor, yes. Uh, and uh, his brother was uh, Shmuel Avidor Cohen, and also uh, Pinchas Peli. So um, well, this is a brilliant family. Um, but he was in the Labor Party. You can have a rabbi in the Labor Party. Um, okay, let's see. Um, it was ben, 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 that was, yeah. What'd you say? That was a faction within the Labor Party known as Ovet Hadati. It was made famous. I remember as a child reading in the whole uh, LL debate on Shabbos, and Rabbi Cohen had to defend the Labor position. And uh, Begin said uh, about uh, Rav Matam and the Knesset blew up, and he said, "Okay, it's a Rav Litam." That's uh huh. yeah okay that's interesting I didn't know that uh, yeah. uh thank you uh Ben Ben Malach says isn't from last week the idea of Rabbi Soloveitchik Menacha just another way of saying Das Torah when many all of you stated that you didn't understand the Rav's reasoning okay you say it's Das Torah well wait till next week because next week we'll see uh, the proposal was that there should be for the Mizrahi like a Moetzes Gedolia Torah and the Rav would be the Das Torah. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about Das Torah next week. Now here the Rav would say not Das Torah, because Das Torah means through the charismatic personality, through the connection through Torah, of learning Torah, the, the sage, the Godel, intuitively knows what the answer should be, not just in Halakha, but on everything, on who to vote for, on decisions. The Rav isn't saying that. He's saying that... Uh, if anything, he's saying that's the Das Torah of the of the Chazal. It's their Das Torah. But he's saying more than that. He's saying it's a Pesach and Torah. Now, how do we know that this Pesach and Torah is, implies for all time? After all, the Pesach also says that uh, the woman's going to have pain in childbirth. Are we going to say then that you can't use anesthesia? I don't know where you draw the line, but the Rav says that it... He, he, I don't. I don't see it as das Torah. I see it as uh, an understanding of how the halachic system works. Uh, uh, you're, you're also saying that only he has this knowledge. You don't. You guys don't agree with him. He's inconsistent, and yet because he has this ephemeral concept of meta halacha, you can't challenge it. And since we're in the mm -hmm. Passover mode, we have a we have the case of Rabbi Yossi Galili who allowed chicken and milk. And it was honored while he was alive. And when he passed away, his Talmudim didn't feel bound by it. I'm not saying it can't be challenged. We saw many people did, but the Rav wouldn't say it's, you might see it as like Das Torah, but the Rav wouldn't see it as Das Torah. Because the Rav, it's not from his charismatic personality or his authority. Uh, he's saying that this is what the, you know, he's not saying that I'm saying this. He's saying that this is what Chazal said. But I understand you. If you don't buy it, it does seem very much like Das Torah. It's the Rav saying that this you must accept this idea. But you all so last week see. said that you didn't under you thought he was inconsistent and didn't understand his reasoning, and yet you went along with it. So that's a form no, from I, you guys treating no, him. No, no, I didn't of, say I went along with it. I said God that I, I said that you could uh, the Talmud that I spoke to who said he didn't understand the reasoning. I said, for all I know, he does, doesn't mean he rejects it. He might say, well, the Rebbe said it, so I accept it. Uh, but he was honest enough to admit that he didn't understand it. It's a, uh, um, are, does this mean that the you, you treat the Rav Soloveitchik like an Admor because uh, you don't understand it? Um, I don't know. I don't think it's so much like an Admor because... Um, in general, uh, the tradition, at least in orthodoxy, is even if you don't understand things, you take the psak of your rav, even if you don't understand it, usually. 
Das Torah is not referring to halacha. That's the whole Chiddush of Das Torah. It's dafka not halacha. It's if the sage says, don't marry this person or vote for this person or, or things that are not halacha. That's the Chiddush of Das Torah. The Rav here is saying that this is halacha. That this, so um, it's, uh, yes, he's not arguing the way Poskin usually argue. And you might say he's applying a Das Torah type of mentality to halacha, but it's not Das Torah. Das Torah is separate from halacha. We'll see even uh, the, the Rav himself said that he never heard this expression, Das Torah, in Europe. Das Torah is, uh, Ramosh also said he never heard it. Uh, and uh, I'll find, I hope I can find her. Tilly Goldstein, I think, has something about Das Torah in the book, if I recall this, and I got to find it. But uh, so I, I don't know. But I, I grant, obviously, for those who don't buy what the Rav is saying, you're going to see him as arguing from authority based upon his psychological understanding, which can't be replicated, which is rejected by the very people who he's describing, namely the women, simply because the Rav is saying that this is the shot in the Pasuk, this is what Chazal mean, and it becomes even more complicated because uh, we have other post scheme who have a completely different approach. So it, it's one of the very troubling things I have with the Rav, and uh, uh, thank you, Mike, for providing the, the link already on academia. Great. Uh, David, there it is. Uh, David says, do I find a connection between Rabbi Rackman's view, Tabmate of Tavmate view, and his liberal views regarding releasing women from Agunot? Yes, that's the whole, uh, the whole uh, from halachic standpoint, he was able to release women from being an Aguna because you can't just release women from being an Aguna because you say, well, I don't want it to be an Aguna. His whole point was that all these men who the women can't get uh, divorced from them, who beat them or anything, or even the fact that the man refuses to give his wife a get, that is itself a sign of a psychological uh, problem with him, a cruelty, which itself made it a mekach taos. And the whole idea of mekach taos is based on tavamet of tandu. Because if you're going to say tavamet of tandu, then... Uh, Mekach um, doesn't work unless it's one of the ones already we see, like from the Rishonim or something, maybe set impotent. But other issues, or uh, let's say uh, he's a tenor or something. But the other issues, you cannot get out of a marriage. Why? Because Tavamet of Tandu, we assume. Uh, so the the whole ba his whole Bastin's approach goes back to Tavamet of, goes back to Mekach Taos, which is inextricably tied to Tavamet of Tandu. And I think that's what the Rav. And that's what you say. If so, that perhaps that's the reason he laughed so sharply. That's what I said last class. But nevertheless, I find it hard to believe that it's subconscious, that it's conscious. It has to be subconscious because otherwise you're saying the Rav is engaging in rhetoric, in polemics. When he says it's a pasuk and based upon the pasuk, it's the women's nature. Are we saying he didn't believe this? He just was using this as a cudgel to beat Rabbi Rackman? He definitely believed it. He elaborates on it. So, uh, but he does understand that giving in on this would lead to all everything else. So maybe subconsciously that's forcing him to read it this way. I, I don't know, but I I can't accept the interpretation of the Rav that some have offered that this is all polemical. If you read what the Rav says, it's not polemical. It doesn't sound polemical. There are other times where the Rav is polemical. <laughs> we'll see. I think with the Mechitza, we'll maybe see an example of polemical. When I say polemical, it doesn't mean it's not true, but... Uh, it has a lot of exceptions to it. This is seems very authentic to me, and the rough lays it all on the line. I challenge anyone to really read from beginning to the end what the rough says and not see this as authentic, authentic rough. Um, oh yeah, Chazaki, you quoted was a uh, different to me. Okay, well the rough says the same thing. He says as Rav Shachter quotes him, he says that today those Chazakas don't apply. So what's the difference? That uh, because those were the sages saying that today. That, that people won't lie publicly. Uh, today we see they will lie. And the difference is there's no Pasuk in Chumash telling you that. Uh, that's that's how the Rav explained it. Um, and David says, when you study in YU in 92, Rav Shalom Karmi brought Svi Kolitsin to be a guest lecturer on Yosel Rakover in his course, Good and Evil on Jewish Side. You know, it's a great story how uh, a um, a novel First becomes accepted as, a, as an authentic thing, and everyone accepts it. We have other examples of this. Like the whole story of, well, 
the, what I'm going to give you is not intended to be a novel, but the story of the uh, the Beisakov girls, the Nadia Beisakov girls who commit suicide. That was fraudulent from the beginning, and that became accepted as um, as historical by some. But that was here. We have an example of where it was the whole thing was intended to be a a fiction, and yet people took it uh, to be real. There's some other examples of that also. I, off the top of my head, I can't uh, think of them. Um, Nissen says the Kula of Rav Moshe includes the basis that our Kohanim or Sveke Kohanim. Yes, that that is an idea that are that's found in Achronim that all our Kohanim are uh, are not absolute. They're Safe Kohanim, and but many Poskim don't accept that. But there are many Poskim do accept that, and it's usually brought in as a sniff. A sniff is like when you're building a tearim, it, it's like a branch. You bring it in, and um, yeah. Um, Someone privately says that um, Professor Moshe Halbertau is critical of the Rav's theory of surrender, pointing out that when the Holocaust surrenders, someone else's life is sacrificed. Uh, that's sort of like what Cardozo, if you want to, um, uh, what's his name again, Rabbi Cardozo? Anyone remember his first name? I'm forgetting now. Uh, Nathan Lopez. Nathan Lopez. Nathan Lopez Cardozo, yeah. <laughs> I, I read what he wrote today because Irene reminded it of me. And uh, listen, I, I'm all for if you want to disagree with the Rav, but Lopez Cardozo, I just think it's overboard. And it's just, uh, you know, just, and I don't like what Rackman says to say if the, that the Rav, uh, the language uh, that he uses, listen to this language. Uh, uh, and I understand the Rav was upset uh, to say the Rav Salvation did not have the courage. It's not a question of courage. It's a question of a, a different approach to the halacha and uh, how to view it. You might not accept it, you might not like it, but it's not that it's not that he doesn't have courage. It's not like he's afraid of being attacked by the right wing. It's not like he doesn't have the courage of his own convictions. Doesn't can't you know have the broad shoulders. He didn't believe it. So if you're going to reject him, reject him and say that he's uh, he's off base, but don't say he didn't have courage. Uh, um, David says the Rav Kefet often tells about his four students he thought who were all brothers with the same father and mother, yet the two older brothers are Kohanim, while the second pair are not Kohanim, and uses this as a brain teaser uh, for students. Well, um, the case is that uh, if uh, they, they, they're they married, they have a couple of children, then they get divorced, the guys are Kohen, they get divorced, and then they get remarried. They're not supposed to, but if they do get remarried, then the next two children would be um, would not be Kohanim, uh, even though it's the same uh, parents. But uh, that's um, not the case that I was talking about. I was talking about a case where uh, one person goes up and duchens and gets called up for the first Ali, and the other person is now. I guess you could say though that the person who got married, he asked the Shaila. He was told he's not a Kohen. This guy never asked the Shaila. And who says who says he has to hold by this psak? But it's still, it's weird, because it, how could you? Uh, okay. Um, okay, so Marty says the confrontation took place, as I described it, but it involved the American and Soviet ambassadors. Yes, that's what uh, I, I remembered. It was the American ambassador. Uh, I knew it wasn't Kenny and Khrushchev. So that's uh, an example of how, I don't know if it's the Rav. Uh, I would think it's Rav Schechter, I think, uh, getting the facts wrong, uh, just in recording it. Um, he said, Adlai, that, uh, he Adlai said to me, Adlai uh, Stevenson was the yes. American ambassador. Yes, exactly. Thanks for reminding me, Adlai Stevenson. Rav Schechter told me that uh, Nefesh Harav, although this passage was not be Minine Harav, but he said Nefesh Harav was, had to be written in a year for the Yort site, and he said that he recorded things that he was told that he learned later were not 100% correct or not accurate. So there's a second edition, he corrected some of them. So he uh, he acknowledges that it's not, uh, not everything is uh, factual. And then the person who emailed me about um, Moshe Halbertal, he said it's a mistake, it was uh, David Hartman. Yes, David Hartman in his last book. And I have to say with all due respect, and thank you Moshe for sending me this great video that uh, Rabbi Hartman gave, where he speaks about Chaim Berlin, he was there, and others speaking about the, the, the role of rabbis in modern times. I think it's a great video. But his last book, which I think is God was not, God is not afraid, or something like that, 
it's hard for me to see Rabbi David Hartman as orthodox after that book, because he basically is willing to do all sorts of things, including in Ishus, which are not orthodox, but he's quite critical of Rabbi Soloveitchik in that book for um, for not doing what he should have done. Um, just uh, It's getting late, so just take a couple more. David says, if the Rav contends that Halacha is not subject to outside influence, I wonder what he thought about Revolutionary's article. Does Jewish tradition recognize an ethic independent of... Um, of halacha. Um, what Rav Lutzin is talking about, I think, is, is something different. He's saying that uh, Rav Lutzin is basically expanding Torah. Not all of Torah is halacha. So uh, we have natural law, we have things like that. The Rav is speaking about halacha. We're going to say that his Chazal uh, decided that this should be the halacha on Sukkot. Uh, because of their environment or Hanukkah or their influence by uh, like Rav Yaakov Elman, you know, you know, the Persian influence on Hilchos Nida, the way the rabbis decided that that's the sort of thing that Rav Soloveitchik saw as just completely out of, uh, out of line that when it comes to Halacha, I don't know what the rub would say about Agada, you know, because uh, it's also a common thing among scholars to point out the various Agadot are influenced by Zoroastrian society, things like that. But to bring it into the Halacha, to say, like Yaakov Elman did with Ilkos Nida, to say that these are influenced by Zoroastrian practices, that for the Rav is just out of bounds. Now, it's not a reform, what Elman's doing, because he's not saying to change the halacha. But if you're going to start, um, you know, changing the halacha based upon that saying that, since, you know, we see where this came from, that would be a change, not a chidush. Um, Okay, so many good questions here, and uh, I, it's just late. And uh, yeah, Herb says that Chaim Soloveitchik and the Rav were not on the same page. Uh, Rabbi Rechefet likes to say that Yaakov Katz had more influence on Chaim Soloveitchik than his own father, uh, um, uh, because he adopted the historical approach. Um, and David says that um, Dr. Moshe Berry published an article does the Chazaka of Tava Meit of Nandu, can that change? And he discusses the Rav's unique position on the Chazaka. So there's a lot to say. Justin says that we don't pass an Alcha based on archaeology. Uh, it seems terribly ironic that a piece of stone carved anonymously established a personal status without any other evidence of Kahuna. That's an interesting point uh, uh, you make there. Um, okay, look, the, um, Dave, Rabbi, should now, the last comment, you mentioned a living covenant by David Hartman. But that's an earlier work. His last book, which is a really interesting book, I think it's God is Not Afraid or something like that. Uh, but the, the 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 piece that Moshe sent me, which I could send anyone who's interested, I never heard uh, really Rabbi Hartman speak. I mean, he's like a fire and brimstone preacher here, and he's talking about what we need that uh, what we need for to revitalize Judaism in the modern day. And um, he, he says that all these people get up there and say, you need to spend 20 years in yeshiva before you can understand, uh, you know, rabbinic uh, theology. He says it's nonsense. And it's just a way of controlling you. He says the Torah was given in all the languages. And uh, he's saying, you know, he's, it's, it's fascinating. I'd never heard him before. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, lots of comments. The ones, if any of you, I didn't get to your comments because I went quickly down. If you think it's important, send it to me. And I'll, I'll I'll begin next class with it. I didn't mean to miss anyone, but I'm looking at the time, and uh, you know we start losing people as we go on, and uh, I, we're supposed to only be an hour, hour ten minutes. But uh, so Rabbi Kelman, on Kol Hamarba, we're in the Pesach spirit. Kol Hamarba, Harazim Shabbat. So okay, thank yeah. you. And then the Pesach spirit tomorrow, Doctor Sokolow, instead of his regular shir on Chalutzim, will be talking on what is Harosa, and Rabbi Shul. Moment of one o'clock will be taught. He's not going to say like what ingredients, you know, it'll be a little <laughs> deeper than that. And Rabbi Shulman says to kids to, or to ask, you know, Kadeshi, Shiluat, you know, what will we answer them? So those are the two Shirim tomorrow. They're, they're a regular Tuesday presenters, but they'll be um, giving on Pesach tomorrow. And all through the week, every day, of course, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, on my Shir, and next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, have, have Shirim every day relating to Pesach. So uh, please, uh, we look forward to seeing you. By the friend, I hope everybody's doing well. And like we said at the beginning, for those who weren't here, don't clean too much. Not good. You're supposed to enjoy Pesach. We have Bittu Chametz. It's good enough. I mean, you have to clean a little, but don't drive yourself crazy. And it's really true. All the everybody do, it's, uh, want to enjoy Pesach and uh, be well. Okay, everybody, enough. And uh, 
Laila Tov, thank you very much. We hope to see you soon. All the best. Um, bye bye. Uh, Laila Tov. Laila Tov, okay.